starting from hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, till the drugs, cyclophenac, the buprovid, then our paracetamol, hydroxy as a phenolite, and the COVID drug, deforestate of all those nutrients for, uh, for the recovery of this platform. We need to set this. But always, this synthesis is a challenging task, the natural products are a bottle synthesis. So what are all the other ways we can use? Where comes your phosphate chemistry or the self-assembling process, which is which are the principles of supramolecular chemistry? So where this principle came from, it is inspired from biology and built on the shoulders of traditional organic chemistry and inorganic coordinate, coordination chemistry. That is a biomimetic system. Always we take inspiration from biology. What happens inside our body or what happens in nature. So why does it deserve to be a field of study all its own? Because this synthetic chemistry and inorganic coordination chemistry, we are learning towards the understanding of the interface between bio and the present nanotechnology. We call it as bio nanotechnology. Coming to the point, what is supramolecular chemistry? So in a line, find the cell chemistry beyond the molecule or the chemistry of molecular assemblies and intermolecular bonds. Some of the scientists say the chemistry of non-covalent bonds, that is non-covalent interactions. So we know atoms through covalent interactions form molecules. Molecules through non-covalent interactions form supermolecules. So this is the easiest way I can put in what is supermolecule or supramolecular chemistry. So the chemistry which is taking place around the supermolecules, we call it as a supramolecular chemistry. So these are some of the supramolecular uh, compounds, cyclodextrin, cocodbutyrol, italic syringe, etc. If you can imagine, we can take a dustbin. So it, that is like a bucket shape. So like this is, if you take the cyclodextrin, this is a bucket shape, a dustbin. So imagine the underneath part is open. So when you put something from the top, we feel it should fall down. But in the case of supramolecular chemistry, if you put something inside, it will never fall down. But there is no linkage between the material you are putting in and this molecule. So this particular molecule is called as a host. And what are all the materials or the analytes you are putting inside is called as the guest molecule. So there is an interaction between this host and the guest. But there is definitely no covalent bond or ionic bond. But it is only purely non-covalent interactions. So similarly, we have protocol materials. We have calyx strains. We have n number of. Molecules. I can show you here. These are all some of the things. Cyclodextrin, calyx rain, cyclopane, cooked material, crown ether, capsule technology, we have fullerenes, nanotubes, and self-assembled process like micelli, vesicle, etc. So what is the what are all the uses? What are all the practical applications of this supramolecular chemistry? Majorly, the practical applications can be classified into four types. One is for sensing, molecular imaging, drug delivery, and metal attraction extraction, of course, catalysis also. So sensing, for example, if you take a pregnancy kit test or your glucose test, you take a drop of blood, put it somewhere, immediately it shows a value. By that value, you tend to know whether you are diabetic or not. So what happens? There is some proteins inside in that that protein and some chemical compound have an interactions, those raw molecular interactions, they give different signals and that is converted into a value for sensing purpose. Then for molecular imaging, if you go for MRI scan or computer tomography CT scan, they inject some chemicals into your body and some light is passed. At that time, when these molecules have an interaction with the protein in your body and due to that light, which you call it as an external stimuli, some signals appear, you take a scan. Similarly for metal extraction from the ores, there are particular receptors for particular cation. For example, if you want to take iron from an ore, so you put a supramolecular there which captures, captures only ion living behind the other. So it is easy to take ion from that, so metal extraction. Then drug delivery system, targeted drug delivery system instantly. Some drugs are not soluble, but if you take cyclodextrin, the inclusion complex, that means some drug which is included inside the cyclodextrin will be soluble. So it can cross through the aqueous layer as well as the lipid layer inside our body and the place where it has to be delivered, it will be delivered there and the cyclodextrin can be excreted. So it is used as a targeted drug delivery system. And for catalysis, some molecules do not react in normal conditions. But when you put a supramolecule into that, 
inside the cavity of the supra molecule, these two molecules react and the product is taken off. So these are all some of the applications, practical applications which are utilized in the current uh, current century. So who are the pioneers for this? There are three famous personalities: Donald J. Crum from USA, Jean Marie Land from France, and C.J. Patterson from USA. They have obtained the Nobel Prize in the year 1987 for their development and use of molecules with structure-specific interactions of high solubility. In particular, it is for C.J. Pedersen who have uh, come up with a crown ether coordinating with potassium, which is an important contribution. Subsequently, after three decades, this chemistry again won a Nobel Prize in 2016, almost after three decades, by Professor Jean Perry Sauer from France, Sir J. Fraser Stoddart from USA, and Bernard L. Peringa from Netherlands for the introduction and advancement of molecular missions. So these supramolecular chemistry, these supramolecules can be tuned into make a molecular missions. So those areas like a nano car or a switch or a molecular muzzle, I will tell a few in the later slides. So this gives rise to many real world applications. So you can know the importance of this supramolecular chemistry because in the three decades, two of the no two team has won the Nobel Prize for this supramolecular chemistry. So what these scientists tell, supramolecular chemistry is the chemistry of the intermolecular bond covering the structure and functions of the entities formed by the association of two or more chemical species, purely non-covalent interactions by Jean Maryland and Professor F. Gauclay told it is chemistry beyond the molecules. You can classify the supramolecules into three types. One is the chemistry of molecules built with specific shapes or architectures. Examples are rotoxin, catenin, dendrimer, fullerenes, and carbon nanotubes, etc. I will show that later. The second one is the lock and key or the host chemistry, which is associated with a molecule recognizing its partner molecule. We have just seen the host chemistry. And the third one is chemistry of molecular assembly, that is the cell assembly. Amplifies, amplifolic molecules, micelles, vesicles, lipophiles, etc like that of your uh, cleaning action of soap by the formation of nipples. That is nothing but a supramolecular cell assembly process. So all these three put together, molecular recognition chemistry, chemistry of molecular assemblies, and chemistry of molecular associations forms the total package of supramolecular chemistry. So these are all some of the important concepts we shall see one by one. Molecular cell assembly, how they assemble together, folding like our DNA which folds by itself, then molecular recognition to recognize various analytes, host guest chemistry, mechanically interlocked molecular architectures, and finally the dynamic covalent chemistry. So there are three possible categories of synthesis of these types of uh, molecules. The small molecules, which I have shown here, these type of small molecules covalently organized or synthesized to form a larger molecule. This you call it as a supramolecule or a supramolecule, and this recognize the guest to form a supramolecular or host guest complex and can be uh, read through various analytical spectroscopic uh, data etc. So this can be done in both solution state and solid state. Similarly, larger molecules, for example, organic linkers and the small guest molecules, metal atoms, metal ions, these two during crystallization forms a certain structure which is solid state. In nature, we have zeolites, we have clathrates, but similarly, synthetically, we can prepare metal organic frameworks like this. So these metals goes and sits in the lattice position, and they may have pores inside where the pores will be uh, applied for various applications. The third one is small molecules, they covalently join to form larger molecules, but with the help of an external stimuli like uh, thermal, like light or pH conditions, they spontaneously organize to form a self-assembled aggregate. This can happen both in solution state and the solid state. Okay, I told there is no covalent or ionic interaction. So what sort of interactions, when you put a material inside a cyclodextrin, I told you in this card, if you take a dustbin which is open at the bottom, and when you put something inside and it is held in the middle, but how come? Because of these five interactions, ionic and dipolar interactions, hydrogen bonding, five interactions, one wall interaction and hydrophobic effect. So because I told it is a fundamental, let me see this 
quickly. So in ion-like interactions, there are three types. So you can see here, there is an interaction between this nitrogen and chlorine, both are ions, positive and negative. There exists an interaction between these two, it's called this ion-ion interaction in the case of tetravidal ammonium chloride. And this is a typical crown ether. I will come to that later on, how to name and everything. So this crown ether has a dipole in the oxygen with a cation. This is called as ion dipole interactions. So now you can understand this crown ether holds or encapsulates or carries the sodium inside its cavity due to an ion dipole interaction. There is no covalent or ionic bond here. And the third one is you can take acetone molecules. Between two acetone molecules, there is a small partial negative and partial positive charge the dipole dipole interactions. So these three contribute to the ion dipole interactions in super molecules. Secondly, the important thing, the hydrogen bonding, which is there in our human body. Many of our amino acids, proteins, and even DNA are through hydrogen bonding. So any hydrogen atom which is attached to an electronegative atom forms an hydrogen bond with an other electronegative atom. So it creates a small positive charge and it's called as a donor. The other one is an acceptor. So between these donor and acceptor, there exists a hydrogen bonding. And the well-known example, orthonitrophenol, which forms intramolecular hydrogen bonding here, and paranitrophenol between two molecules, it forms hydrogen bonding. So this type of hydrogen bonding is very, very important in supramolecular Thirdly, the pi interactions. I don't know how many of you really understood pi pi stacking or pi pi interactions. So this pi pi interactions I'll talk about in the next slide. It is again classified into three, cation pi, anion pi, and polar pi interactions. So cation pi, it is the interaction between a cation and the pi electron cloud here, between benzene. When, when these two interact, then it is called this cation pi interaction. And here it is the anion uh, interactions. So one can think both are negatively charged and how there will be an interaction. For example, if you take, if you have electron withdrawing groups around this benzene ring, if you take hexafluorobenzene, so the electron, if this, here it will be electron poor region and here it is electron rich region, there is an interaction which is called this anion pi interactions. And the third type is polar pi interactions. There are Permanent dipole molecules, example is water. So this permanent dipole molecules and the pi electron cloud, there is this an interaction which is called as polar pi interactions. These are also responsible for supramolecular interactions. So this I told you the pi pi interactions here. The pi pi interactions into three types. One is the sandwich type, that is two benzene ring comes together. Face to face, they uh, have an interaction which you can see in graphite molecule, or if you even you can see in the DNA base pairs, they sandwich each other, that is one. The second one is edge to face, one benzene ring is third perpendicular to the other benzene ring. Here you can see here, so this partial positive atom have an interaction with the pi electron cloud. So this is called as edge to face, and the third one is displaced. So, so this positive will be with this pi electron cloud, and this positive with this pi electron cloud. This is called as parallel displaced or displaced so these are all different types of pi interactions which is involved in supramolecular chemistry. And the fourth one is one of those interactions. Everybody know, knew this very well. The fluctuations from electron distribution. We have two things. One is the London interaction because of the exchange and repulsion interactions. So two instantaneous dipoles attract each other which produce a London interaction. So you can see the electrons are revolving around the nucleus. But this nucleus attracts this electrons towards its side. And this nucleus attracts the other nucleus towards its side. There exists an instantaneous dipole. It is not a permanent dipole there. So instantaneous dipole. Due to this, they are attracted to each other. And this also plays a major role in supramolecular interaction. The final one is the hydrophobic effect. For example, if you take this cavity, this cavity is full of water molecules, hydrophobic cavity. So when you put some other guest, so when it is inside the water hole, arranged in an organized manner. But when you put a guest molecule inside, the water is smashed outside and it becomes disordered. So entropy factor arises. So this is one such hydrophobic effect. The second one is two organic molecules creating a hole within a aqueous space giving rise to the entropy hydrophobic effect. That is one hole is more stable than two. 
So when you take oil and water mix together and stir it, there may be many many oil droplets uh, floating on the water. But after some time, all the oil joins together to form one. So that is what this one hole is more stable than two. So this plays a major role in supramolecular interaction, and this is taking place in antiphilic structures like where hydrophilic heads and the hydrophobic tails they join to form micelles and they subsequently join vesicles etc in our lipid bilayers inside our body. So I have gone through a brief uh, introduction to the supramolecular intra interactions, five types. Now what is the fundamental or what is the basic thing for the supramolecular chemistry but from where it has arisen? It is by Professor Emil Fischer the lock and key principle. He won, he won the Nobel Prize in 1902. So for in order for two species to interact in a specific fashion, they must have complementarity, cooperativity, shape, size, etc. and good chemistry between them just like a lock fits into a, sorry, a key fitting into a lock. So different types of keys cannot open the same lock. So it should be the same, the lock and key it should be same. So this is recognized even before molecular structure was well understood that shape and size matters. Besides the bordings, the shape and size of a molecule is more important in the case of supramolecular chemistry. If that differs, you don't have a supramolecular chemistry form. So the lock and key principle after his invention, I have shown you here the lock and key principle, the lock and the key where it exactly fits and it opens. So there is sort of interaction. So the cavity size, the shape, everything matters here. But there are several drawbacks in this lock and key principles. Everybody might, might knew this lock and key principle since we are studying from our childhood. The enzymes are highly flexible, so they cannot be rigid. And they are conformationally dynamic in solution, unlike a rigid lock. So these are all the drawbacks. These drawbacks were ruled out by Professor Daniel Kirschland in 1958. And he came out with a new principle called as the induced principle. In this, Enzymes are dynamically, I mean, conformationally dynamic, we know that. So there are certain things called as the active sites in the enzymes. They change their shape and size according to the substrate, so that they can accommodate the substrate into it. You can see here, the enzyme here is not, I mean, it's on different uh, cavity shape and size, but here the substrate is different. But when the substrate approaches the enzyme, it changes its size and shape and forms the enzyme substrate. So this is where the inspiration taken and the supramolecular chemistry is developed. So we are using synonymous terminologies like a host guest or a ligand metal or just now we saw enzyme substrate or receptor substrate or supramolecular chemistry and you can see here if this is the key. So some enzymes carrying a hydrophobic interactions at one part, electrostatic interactions at another part, hydrogen bond at another part. It exactly fits your protein molecules or the receptors so that the uh, desired properties taking place. So the study of non-covalent interactions is very, very crucial to understanding many biological processes from the cell structure to vision that rely on these forces for structure and function. how it is happening. So biological systems are often the inspiration for supramolecular research. Even now we are struggling hard to find a drug or a vaccine for COVID. So we know the structure of COVID and we know how it goes inside the body where it attacks, we know the receptors. So we take out the receptors and then we perform some drug molecule synthesis and we should have the interaction between those receptors and the drug exactly so that the receptor should not multiply or kill the virus so that disease will be cured. So this is very important, the supramolecular interactions. As I told you, it is there in our body, the DNA. The bonding between the base pairs, cytosine and thiamine, cytosine and thiamine or adenine and guanine, here it's involving hydrogen bonding. Because of this hydrogen bonding, you have your DNA molecule duplex structure. Similarly, you have biotin streptavidin phosphorus complex. Biotin binds to a protein called as streptavidin. The streptavidin is nothing but uh, the amino acids, all around the amino acids are involved. This is the biotin molecule. Between these two, there exists the hydrogen bond. So these are all the things which are already getting inside our body, which is happening inside our body. So taking that inspiration, we have developed many synthetic molecules in supramolecular chemistry. So this is one other example. Just now I told you about COVID drugs. It is a chiral drug and its binding site. 
So if you take ephedrine and pseudoephedrine. So ephedrine is a drug which is used to prevent low blood pressure and then for asthma, etc. But not pseudoephedrine. Pseudoephedrine is used for like a sinus problem or nose, nasty nose, etc. So you can see here in this structure, there is this OH group is facing down, which is a flat hydrophobic area, this one. But this hydrogen bonding, this is responsible for hydrogen bonding with the receptor. So if our body has a receptor, suitable receptor for this OH bond, so it has an hydrogen bonding and your drug action takes place. But in the case of pseudoephedrine, this OH is missing here, it is in the upper side, it is missing here and it will not take in, it will not uh, prevent the disease or it will not have this type of uh, low blood pressure or asthma disease. So there is a difference between epidrine and pseudoepidrine. So this hydrogen bonding, as I told you, one among the supramolecular interaction, I just showed you an example how important it is. So coming to the classification, let's see one by one. This is the house gas chemistry. So this is the first one. You can take uh, small molecules, covalently organized or synthesized to form the host. And depending upon the cavity, so here you can see this cavity is spherical. So only this molecule can be accommodated here and not this triangle. So by non-covalent synthesis, you form a complex which is called as a supermolecule. So it selectively binds only this and not this one. So that is called this selectivity. I'll come to that again. How it developed? Professor Pedersen, in 1967, he discovered the crown ether. This is what called as crown ether, dibenzo crown ether. He did a small organic reactions to prepare this phenol, this molecule, to prepare a bisphenol. But he got an impurity that is 0.4 percent. Synthetic organic chemists will note this. We should not leave out the impurities present in any reactions. If you take that impurity and he has analyzed and he got a minor product of just 0.4 percent as dibenzocrown meters. This is formed because of sodium here. This sodium is encapsulated in the middle as a template and this molecule is formed. So this is the start and for this in no way to work, he got this Nobel Prize. So that's what I mean selectivity test. The binding of a guest, one guest or a family of guests, significantly more strongly than others by a host molecule. Selectivity is measured in terms of the ratio between equilibrium constants. So you can see here if you take this as a host molecule, there are several analytes, maybe metals, maybe anions, maybe amino acids, proteins, even uh, bacterial molecules, there are many molecules, thought box lakes, etc. According to the shape and size, only this will be exactly fitting, not the others. So this is called as a supramolecule or a supermolecule, and this fits only because of non-covalent bonds, and there is no other covalent or ionic bonds involved in it. And this is called as a osteous chemistry, and this is called as selectivity, because it only selects this one according to the shape and size of the cavity. And the chemistry, the cooperativity, the complementarity between the host and guest molecules. So this is one of our research work. So this is what the host molecule, which is called as PPC, and it has five different uh, heteroatoms here. So these heteroatoms can donate a pair of electrons to bound the silver ion. You can see here, this is done by fluorimetric analysis, fluorescence. Several cations have been, have been analyzed. Only silver, it selectively binds, not all the other ions. And you can see the color change also from light blue to purple color. And it has been determined with NMR titration also. So this is called as selectivity, which is more important. For example, if you want to uh, selectively test the calcium content in your body, you need a sensor for calcium alone. But if you make a sensor for all the metals, then it is of no use. So it should selectively bind calcium and get the value. But it will be competitive with other metal ions such as zinc or uh, cadmium, mercury, etc. So this part is called as selectivity. Okay, let me explain in a layman language. So everybody know about the watermelons. You can see its shape and different carvings you can make, like a well or a rose or, a, or even a car. But because of its shape, oval shape, transportation is very hard. You cannot arrange that in a truck. You have to just throw it. It slips from one, end, one, one piece to another. Instead of loading, for example, if you load bricks, you can load in a regular, organized manner on a truck. But these uh, watermelons cannot be done. So one scientist thought of that. 
So for these problems, he came with an innovative idea that is called as the fire watermelons. You might have seen this in Google. So this is uh, invented in Japan and China. So they have uh, made a cage around it and they have brought out with fire watermelon. So this fire watermelon for cutting it is very easy, for eating very easy, for transportation, for arranging, for everything this is very easy. So the shape, the size matters. I am stressing on that. And not only watermelons, these days you can have, see whatever shape you want. You can have a square, you can have a heart shape, you can have a pentagon, you can have a like see star shape, even cucumber, you can have a square apple. So no more teaching to your kids like banana will be in this shape, mango will be in this shape, apple will be in this shape, never. So after the advancement of this supramolecular chemistry, each and every shape and size matches. This is all quite a few examples. Even you can have orange, it is pentagon orange. You can have even a Buddha, it is in the tree, you can see. It. So everything is possible these days because as I told you the next generation or the next era will be mainly on supramolecular bio nanotechnology so you it, it depends upon the shape and size no more each entity is of some shape which we have studied from generation to generation right so let me uh, go down to the three important aspects that is cation binding anion binding and neutral molecular binding so where I will discuss, I will take one example of supramolecule and how it forms the binding interactions. So cation binding, you all very well know that cation complexes play an essential role in many biological systems. So large quantities of sodium, potassium, magnesium, calcium, they are in particular critical to life. Sodium and potassium are very much. Even now, a known person is admitted in the hospital for a lower amount of uh, sodium. Another one day delay, he might have gone to coma, but now he's slowly improving with a lot of sodium content given to his body. So the importance of metal ions is shown here in humans. These are all the essential metal ions, calcium, sodium, potassium, magnesium, and trace elements like iron, copper, cobalt, zinc. It should be balanced in your body. It should be neither high nor low. They are important in our body. So sodium, potassium, they regulate body metabolisms. Calcium, bones and teeth for arthritis, you know very well. Then metalloproteins and metalloenzymes for redox reactions, copper, like that. If it, any disorders occurs, that means whether it is higher in content or lower in content, anemia, liver, kidney damage happens if it is in the case of iron. In the case of zinc, type 1 and type 2 occurs, or in the case of copper, Alzheimer, Wilkinson, so on and so forth. So the crown eaters, you know very well. I'll take this as an example for a cation host or a cation receptor. So cyclic polyethers derived from repeating OCH to CH2 units. It forms stable complexes with metal ions as we saw Professor Pedersen in what he has done and it has many synthetic reactions, re reactions involved in it. So this is a typical crown ether. It is called as 18 crown sticks. So this is like a crown for a cave. So it represents like that. So the name crown came and it has six oxygen atoms. So it is six and you can see the number of bonds if we found. So this is 1, 2, 3. So here 3, 6, 9, 12, 15 and 18. So 18, crown so, and 6. Excuse me sir. It's a, another 3 minutes are going to end sir. Kindly rejoin sir if it, if it, if it is ends in between. I have to rejoin with the same. Yes sir, yes sir, yes sir. Thank you. Another 3 minutes. Yes, yes, thank you sir. Thank you. Okay, so this is what that crown eater means. So this crown eater, you can see it is a simulated diagram. It is like highly negatively charged uh, cavity inside because of this uh, oxygen atoms inside. So as I told, it binds with potassium, neither with sodium nor with lithium. If you take that first group elements, it only binds with this potassium because of the shape and size. A stable Lewis acid based complex with potassium. You can see here the simulated picture. So the example I have to tell you, what is the use of this crown meter? Ion complexing and solubility. This potassium fluoride is not soluble in benzene. But when you put 18 crown inside that, so this potassium is captured by this crown and this chlorine is released. So this chlorine is away and it is highly reactive. And this is called as naked anion effect. So this F is carried into benzene and it is called as a naked anion effect and it is highly reactive. So this can be used in reactions. 
that's what I told you here. So you can see here when you want to convert one bromo octane to one fluoro octane, if you use KF, you know that KF is not soluble in toluene or benzene. And if you put KF in some of the protic solvents, this fluorine is strongly solvated by the ion dipole forces we have seen before. And it is neither basic or nucleophilic nucleophile to have a nucleophilic substitution for this bromine by chlorine. So you add a pinch of 18 crown 6 in toluene. So this 18 crown 6 captures this potassium so that this fluorine, which is called the naked anion, easily replaces this bromine to form one chloroquine. Without this 18 crown 6, there is absolutely no reaction. This is one typical example why the crown is obtained and what is the use of the calcium molecule. So, depending upon the size and shape, see here 12 crown 4, I told you here 4 oxygen atoms, so it is 4, and then 1, 2, 3, 6, 9, and 12, so 12 crown 4. It can bind with lithium, it can bind with sodium, potassium, rubidium, cesium. Okay. Okay. So, shape of the cavity after crown comes nitrogen, it is called as azar crowns, and thereby develop triptans, spirans, lariat ethers, etc. I have just discussed one example for cation findings. All the rest you can go through in the literature. So, this is another application, as I told you, it is used in as a chemo biosensor. So organic molecules designed to bind and send small molecules of metals or ions. So three type of things needed here, a chlorophore, a linker and an ionophore. So this ionophore binds with this metal ion so that there is a signal change in this chlorophore. So that signal is taken and you can have a chemobiosensor for whatever metal ions you want or amino acids or anions, cations, etc. So this is called as a chlorophore and a linker or a phaser and an ionophore. And for these type of things, this Supramolecular chemistry as a host gas chemistry is used. There are many, many uh, fluorochemo sensors have been developed. So I'm coming uh, to the same thing, the selectivity. So this molecular host is called a chemo sensor, exactly fitting with any of the analytes, that is the metal anions and metal ions, and it forms a complex so that it glows either pinches or so anything. this is where we stop the molecular recognition and selectivity. So the chemo sensor and metal ions forms a complex and you have different signals. So this is what I told you in another pictorial diagram. So you have a host molecule and you have different metal ions or any other anions. So exactly matching the shape and size gives you a signal that can be transferred into a value. You can get the details like that of your uh, blood glucose sensors or any other sensors. So the working mantra is there is no interaction, there is no information. So that is what the supramolecular interaction is all about. So next step is the receptor for anion. You have seen for cations, it is almost constructing a receptor for cations is very easy as most of the cations are spherical in shape. But if you take for anions, they have three different properties. They come in many shapes and sizes. For example, halides are spherical, thiocyanate linear. If you take nitrate, it is planar. If you take phosphate, it is tetrahedral. Hexafluorophosphate, it is octahedral, and so on. So imagine about the nucleoside, nucleotides or the biological molecules inside of the human. For example, this COVID-19, they are targeting two different receptors. One is the CD147, that is the cluster of differentiation 147, and GRP78, glucose regulated proteins. They target these two receptors. We need to know these two receptor structure and design a drug or a vaccine where the interaction takes place and either other their mutations or multiplications to overcome this COVID-19. Secondly, they are, most ions exist in a narrow pH range. They don't have the wide pH range from 1 to 14. They will not work. They will work in a widely specific pH range. And they are generally coordinating, coordinated with saturated like this pH or for pH potassium flow. So what sort of receptors we can use for this anion? We can have charged receptors that is positively charged. The second one is the neutral receptor. So you can have the positively charged receptors like guanidinium derivatives. You can see there, it, nitrogen contains a small positive charge molecule so that it can attract the carboxylate anions. Similarly, aminidium derivative also can have carboxylate anions. So a positively charged 
receptor essential for uh, anion detectorizing or anion sensors. And apart from that positive charge, I told you even the neutral uh, receptors or the neutral uh, interactions like hydrogen bonding interactions. You can see this particular molecule here, you can see there is a positive charge involved as well as the hydrogen bonding is involved. So this, this can capture the anion very well. So these type of receptors are much more efficient than only positive charge. Why these receptors are taking place? For example, many of you are suffering from thyroid. Either iodine content may be more or less. When you go to a doctor, when you go to a biochemical laboratory, they immediately tell some values of iodine. How it is done? So these type of receptors have been constructed to capture iodine here. Once there is an interaction between the iodine and this molecule, it is converted into a value and that value is shown for you. So without these, you cannot estimate how much of iodine, iodine content is there in your body. Maybe iodine, chlorine, chlorine, or whatever, anions, it is even carboxylate, like glucose, for example. So you need to have anion receptors here. So it is a combination of electrostatic interactions, maybe positive, negative, or ion, etc., and, and a hydrogen body. Then we shall go to the neutral molecules, the third one. You can see this is a was. Alexorane is a molecule which is typically mimic to a was. So it has an upper ring of uh, uh, upper ring and a lower ring, and this is a macro cycle like this. So it can encapsulate molecules inside anions as well as cations inside. So this is constructed with phenol molecule, it is called as calcarane. If it is constructed from resorphenol, it is called as resorphenol, and so on. You can see here this calcarane encapsulates a neutral molecule that is the buckyball or fullerene here. It is similar to that of a soccer football world cup. So this is a simulated and how it can encapsulate. So this encapsulation has told you the applications before. What is the use of this encapsulation? So you can see this as the new, new, I mean neutral molecules, cyclodextrin, which is naturally available, alpha cyclodextrin, beta cyclodextrin, gamma cyclodextrin, and, and they are three organized microcycles. That means their cavity, their dimensions are predefined. You cannot alter them. So only according to this cavity size and the shape, critical shape, you can accommodate the guest molecules. Sometimes if it is smaller, it will not be holding here. If it is bigger, it cannot go inside here. It should be exactly the same. This is very natural. And in synthetic, we have superbutyrol. So this is also cavity molecules. If you put something, in principle, it should fall down. But some of the guest molecules are there inside itself. It is prepared from glycolurel. This is called glycolurel. Six such units forms CB6, this one, five such units going to form CB5 and so on and so forth. And this is cucurbitril because this belongs to the family called cucurbitril CA. So from there, cucurbitril is taken and it is given the name as cucurbitril. And this is another microcycle which gains much attraction in, in this era of research. So you can see the inclusion complexes inside cyclodexin which is included and then excluded. You can make many examples or many reactions taking place in this one. It can be used as a phase transfer catalyst between organic and uh, those substances which are not soluble in organic phase, which are soluble in aqueous phase only. This type of cyclodexin can be added inside. So it can be, it will phase transfer the organic soluble components to the uh, aqueous soluble components and so the reaction takes place. So you can have products. So substrate can be put in and you can have products. Many number of catalytic reactions are these type of reactions taking place. So in a nutshell, host gas chemistry, molecular precursors is joined to form molecular chemistry and that recognize the host and you call chemistry beyond molecules. The second one is the cell assembly according to the classification. You can see here the molecules are distributed uneven. They are not ordered. They are disordered here. But when you give an external stimuli, light, thermal, pH, something, they become an spontaneous and it is reversible. When you take out the external stimuli, it will go back to its original position. So these type of things, we call it as self-assembly, very much used in today's nanotechnology. For example, a mirror can be transparent at one stage when they are disoriented, but when you switch on the light, when you pass electric current, or when you pass heat or when you pass something, external stimuli which I mean, it may organize itself and become opaque. So like these type of strategies are taking place more in nanotechnology. 
So it is called as a self assembly process. How do you synthesis that? You put a template in the middle. Along this template, all these things forms a supramolecule, and then you can remove that template outside. So if you get a molecule like this, a self assembly, they all come together because of this template. In this organization, we have many, many architectures, structures here. Let us see some of them, which are called as ladders, grids, racks, etc. And they have different properties like optical, redox, magnetic, catalytic. Mainly they are constructed with two things. One is the ligand, organic molecule, the other one is the metal ion. You can see here they have three basic levels. One is the regulation. So they have the selective interaction of complementary components, as I told the shape, size, cooperativity, complementary, complementarity, and its uh, chemistry between the two, the ligand and the metal. Second one is orientation, how they orient into what type of structure. The third one is after building up the term, I mean, structure that terminate to the desired structure, supramolecular, desired discrete supramolecular entities. So these are all the cartoon diagrams. You can see here a rack is there, a ladder is there, a grid is there. Is it possible to have these type of structures in chemistry and chemical molecules? Of course, you can see here if you take a capillary molecule with the help of ruthenium metal, this is organic ligand, this is the organic ligand. And this is a ruthenium catalyst, I mean, sorry, ruthenium metal. They both join to form with the help of an entopic ligand. This is called an entopic ligand, and metal ions are arranged, similar to a ladder. So it is called as ladders in supramolecular chemistry. And these parts are called as poles. Similarly, if you take two polytopic ligands, this is one bipedal, another bipedal connected by a number of systems like this. These are called as rungs. And these structures are called as ladders. Here, copper acts as a template here. You can see by supramolecular chemistry, these are called as ladders, supramolecular ladder. And similarly, you can have supramolecular grid, a square grid, rectangular grid, etc. Even chiral grid is very much possible. So I have shown the cartoon diagram and an example of the chemical structures. The next one is mechanically interlocked supramolecules. Here Absolutely no covalent bonds or chemical bonds are involved. It is just like a chain, two chains connected to each other. So they are threaded one and around each other to form a single entity. It is supported by supramolecular interactions. So this is called as a rotoxane. You can see that this is called as a rotoxane. And this middle green color represents the macrocycle. And these two bulky groups are called as the capped end parts. So this Macrocycle will not slip away from here. A typical dumbbells, what you call it. So you can see here, this is a rotoxin. If one of the cap or the two of the cap is missing, then it is called as pseudo rotoxin. You can see the structure here. This is a triphenyl molecule, this is the capping agent, and this biphenyl molecule it traps the macrocycle uh, cyclodextrin in the middle, and this is the another biphenyl. So you can see here, this is a typical construction of a rotoxin. So the cyclodextrin macrocycle is here and both the sides it is, it is a typical rotoxane structure. I told about the architectures of supramolecular chemistry, this is one side. The second one is catenanes. So this is two ring structures, there is no absolutely no connection between these two, but they are there with the help of weak water walls or weak interactions or supramolecular interactions. So here it crosses one time and two times so and two molecules involved it is called two crossing two catenanes. But here it crosses one, two, three, and four, so four crossing two catalytes. So this is the example you can see here. These are all the structures and the bipedal reacts with the dialing dichromate to get a catalyst structure. You can see here this example, this is called as a molecular switch. So here when the copper one stage, when it is in copper one complex, it is coordinated to phenanthrolin compound, phenanthrolin uh, scaffold, there you get a tetrahedral structure. But when it is oxidized to copper 2, we get a square pyramidal. Now it is attached to the uh, temperate molecule. So this is called as on off process, a switch on and switch off process. So this can be used as molecular switches, catalytics. The next one is knots. So they occur frequently in everyday life, both in our microscopic world, like your ties, your shoelaces, and even in DNA form knotted structure. You can see here, just like in Tamil, the letter E, and they are intrinsically chiral. This E is not equivalent to this one. So these both are chiral, they are called as energy units. You can see here, if you take this phenanthrene molecule, it forms itself 
with the help of a metal, it forms a knot like structure. They are called as supramolecular polygon knot of chains or knots. You have boromiates. So, this is typical three ring system. Five rings we know it is used for polybics. It is a three ring system. So, the boromian rings consist of three topological circles which are linked to form a Brunian link. So, this name came from the Brunian family. They are in Italy. I mean, long back. Removing any ring results in two unlinked rings. That is, no two of the three rings are linked together. If you remove any one ring, either this or this, all three will be split. So, no two of the three rings are linked to each other. But nonetheless, all three things are linked together. It's called as boromiates. So, the example is this when you take bicredin derivatives and react with 2426 uh, credin dialdehyde, you get these type of boromiates with a zinc as a template as a metal. You get boromiates. Okay, so those are all some of the structures. There are very many structures involved. So, I have given you a few examples of supramolecular architectures. And where it is involved? I told you a molecular switch, switch in the case of a catamine, but you can see in the rotoxane. You can see here this is a rotoxane, this is capped here, this is capped here, and these two macrocycles are there in the middle. So, this is in the state, and this is in the titan state, we can call it this. Just I have given an example for a biceps. When you take the biceps, when it is tightened, it is bulges and it is relaxed state. The external stimuli is your light of wavelength 254 nanometer, you get like this, or you get like this. So, based on the external stimuli, you get a tightened state or a relaxed state. So, this can act as a molecular muscle. A typical one example. So, like that, there are many, many examples you can go through the literature. So, there are some additional supramolecules, which is called as dendrimus, highly branched and star shaped macromolecules with 3 nanometer dimensions. It has three parts the core part here and the interior dendritic structures. It is goes to generation 1, this is generation 1, 2, 3, like that it goes. And terminally, it is functionalized. But basically, all, all three together, we call it as dendrimus, and they tell for example to form different structures. Next one is capsule. So, two or more molecules, self assembly, which are complementary to each other, they self assemble like this. This carried in into two, they self assemble and trap a guest molecule inside. You can see this molecule traps a pyrazine molecule inside. So these are called as supramolecular capsules. And you know in nanotechnology you have a fluorine, which is an allotrope of carbon, whose molecule consists of carbon atoms connected by single and double bonds. You have several fluorine molecules. So if entraps are just inside, then it is called as endohedral. If it is functionalized outside, it is called as exohedral components. Ma'am, still I have time or shall I close? Excuse me? Sir, how are you? Yes sir, yes sir, having time sir, our 15 minutes we are having, sir, continue sir. Yeah, thank you. So the last part is the metal organic frameworks. So as I told you, this metal organic framework involves the solid state, uh, host based or solid state chemistry, where the organic linker and the metal ion clusters together form these type of structures. We have known the typical gradius lattice that is older generation. Now we have n number of crystal structures. So, these metal organic frameworks are a new class of crystal hybrid nanoporous materials. Some scientists call this as metal organic porous material. So, always there are fight between the scientists. So, some call as metal organic frameworks and some call it as metal organic porous materials. The famous scientists are Professor Timur Kim in uh, Korea and uh, Professor Omar Yagi and Professor Korea Dori in the US. So, when you have uh, metal and the uh, Organic linker you call metal organic frameworks. Without the metal, it is called as covalent organic framework and you have porous polymer networks. So these are them. So what do you mean by pores? So pores having minute interstices through which liquid or air may pass. So you can see here, these are all the examples. Surface of a chicken eggshell, which is micro pores less than 2 nanometers. We have mesoporous material, carbon membrane 2 to 50 nanometers, and macro pores more than 50 nanometers or in a monolithic color. So these are all the porous materials existing in nature, lungs, bones, the alveoli in the lungs, and then sandstone, peas, pond, snow, eggshell, lemons, etc. And these are the artificial porous materials, clothing, chalk, brick, concrete, sponges, bread, etc. So how they design, you take the metal ions, 
and with various size and shape of the ligands, whichever you want, and also in the metal ions, the tetrahedrate or the pyridate or a trident and whatever uh, they did, uh, I mean, ligands you can take and even the coordination behavior of the metals you can choose and you get different types of spectrums with different way of synthesis. You can see this is one of the structures which is called as MOF5, benzene dicarboxylic acid, this is benzene dicarboxylic acid and zinc atoms, tetrahedral zinc atoms, they form a structure which is called as MOF5, there are pores here where it can have gas storage etc. Then MOF74, this is MOF74, benzene dicarboxylic acid with two hydroxyl groups, which have a high carbon dioxide absorption inside the pores, this structure. So similarly, we have MIL100, there are N number of things, MIL54, EIO66, like that, there are several, you can see in the literature. I have quoted a few examples of MOFs. How they can be synthesized? By solothermal, hydrothermal, microwave assisted, sonochemical, mechanochemical, so on and so forth. So they have two broad industrial applications because of the key attributes, two things. They are extremely large surface area and their flexibility with which the structure can be varied. You can have different structures. You can tailor made the structure. They are also very robust, rigid, with high mechanical and thermal capabilities. So these are all the various applications. They can use for separation of gases, separation of molecules, gas storages, as sensor molecules, drug storage, as a catalyst, as a purification agent, many, many applications are found for MOFs. So far, we have seen about non-covalent interaction in citromolecular chemistry. What about mixing both a covalent as well as a non-covalent together? So you can see here the enantial selective recognition of amino alcohols. So I'm not talking about amino alcohols. I'm talking about the chirality conversion of amino acids. You know very well though about what you mean by chirality is non-superimposable to mirror images. So this is a typical binaptol, which is an axillary chiral molecule, which contains an aldehyde group and hydroxy group, and dependent or a hanging group of hydrogen bond donors. So this aldehyde reacts with an imine, with an amino acid, which has an amine group. So it forms an aldehyde or an imine. And it forms a resonance assisted hydrogen bonding with this OH. So that is covalent bonded. And this hydrogen bond, this is called as the non covalent interactions. The covalent interaction and the non covalent interaction, if you put an L amino acid to this receptor, in 48 hours, all the L, I mean 99% is converted into B amino acid. So here involves both covalent and so here this is called the this is what the aldehyde and this is the chira because of the steric uh, this here and this is what the supramolecular interaction one of the supramolecular interaction hydrogen and this is your resonance hydrogen bonding and amine bond this is covalent and this is non covalent so you can see what happens so this is a typical receptor I'm not talking about the synthesis here. So which has an aldehyde group here and has a uriel group here, this two NH are strong hydrogen bond donors. So acid reacts with this, it forms an imine, and the COH group reacts with this through hydrogen bonding. So the L amino acid reacts here and in 24 hours to 48 hours of time, the L amino acid is converted to the amino acid. So when you block this Resonance assisted hydrogen bonding, a supramolecular interaction, when you block this by CH3, the molecule doesn't convert. Or if there is no bonding as a pendant, the support supramolecular interaction is not there, the L amino acids are not converted to the amino acid. You can see here with the salts of amino acid, so this is the NMR spectrum, this is that imine spectrum, so this NH. This H proton is given here, and this two uranium proton are given here. And this CH2 proton are given here, benzyl CH2 proton. So forget about the others. You can see these protons here. This is one for L and the other for B. So this is for B alanin and this is for L alanin. There is a chiral discrimination because of this covalent interaction and this and this non covalent interaction here. So this is in the case of salt, it only recognizes this chiral recognition between. B and L. But when you take natural amino acid, this is phenyl alanin, L phenyl alanin, alanin. When you put this N phenyl, it's not anilin, it is alanin. So when you put this here inside, so it forms a imine bond, and there is a 
a non-covalent hydrogen bonding here, and this COO has an hydrogen bonding interaction here. You can see here, these are all the L alanine in day one, in one hour period. As this goes on in four days, you can see all the L gets converted into B. So you can see the L alanine peak diminishes and the B alanine peak increases. So you can see for the other uh, 24 available or natural amino acids, you can see the imine peak or the ural peak, the L at the start one hour, the L peak is more, but as time goes on in 45 hours, all the L is diminished and the D is high. So that means all the L amino acids is converted to D amino acids. This is another advantage of both combining supramolecular, I mean combining the covalent and the non-covalent. So let us come to the supramolecular chemistry applications. As I told you, it is used in chemistry of sensing, it is used in chemistry of molecular imaging, metal extraction, drug formulation and delivery catalysis. So you can see here we have seen steam before. It, uh, it can be helpful in, as a phase transfer catalyst, wherein you can have a potassium captured here and chlorine is free, so you can have nucleophilic substitution reactions. So drug delivery system, this may not be soluble in lipids and aqueous phase, but on encapsulation into cyclodextrin, it is relevant soluble and it can easily deliver a drug. And separation of mixtures, if you take P60 and P70 mixture, when you put a calyxlane or something inside, it captures P60, so that P70 is freely taken away by solubilizing, I mean, solubilizing in solvent, but this guy is insoluble in solvent, so that when you put it in chloroform, the C60 is soluble in chloroform, it can be taken out and this calculate is recycled again. So it is used for separation of mixtures and then as I told you the molecular sensors, so this is the uh, reporter group, the fluorescent molecules or whatever you put it there or the transducers or something and they are, and uh, I mean this, this group. And this G is the guest species. Whenever the guest is fine, it gives its uh, signals so where you can measure what we want. And this is, I told you, the molecular switches. Switch on and switch off. So this is a chlorophore and this uh, crown can take the sodium here. When it binds sodium, this chlorophore may flow or may uh, quench or something. So wherein we can get some good results out of it. Then phase transfer catalyst, just now we saw. I'm giving you again another example. And then photochemical supramolecule. So this also we have discussed is a biochemosynthesis. So this is the signaling unit, and you have a spacer and you have a reporter group, sorry, receptor group. When a substrate or analyte binds here, the signal unit gives a signal. This is an example. You can see the same anthem green and uh, brown here. So it can capture uh, some metal or something and it gives some emission. From there you can have your uh, signals or converting the data. I come to conclusion by that gurus cannot be replaced by Google's and teachers cannot be replaced by technology. Thank you. I still have